Hi, I'm Julia Lupton, and I'm very happy to share this brief introduction to Coriolanus on behalf of the Irvine Barclay Theater and UCI's New Swan Shakespeare Center, and in anticipation of National Theater's streaming of their riveting performance of Coriolanus, featuring the mesmerizing Tom Hiddleston in the title role. You are going to love him, plus a great cast of supporting actors. So what's Coriolanus all about? Coriolanus is one of Shakespeare's Roman plays, along with Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra, as well as Titus Andronicus. Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra are about the end of the Roman Republic and the beginnings of the Roman Empire. In Coriolanus, we are going back to the founding of the Roman Republic, a few centuries earlier than the other Roman plays. The Roman kings called the Tarquins have been exiled, thanks to the military skill and leadership of aristocratic warrior leaders like Coriolanus. A republic has been installed in its place, with most of the power initially in the hands of the senators, all from noble families. But now the senators are learning to power share with the working people, they're called the citizens, but also the crafts or the mechanics in the play because they work with their hands. And it's a rough transition. So what makes our play tick? Well, it's dominated by Martius Cassius, called Coriolanus because of his victory over a neighboring group called the Volsci at the town of Coriolis. You will hear him called both Martius Cassius and Coriolanus in the play. Although he helped get rid of the kings, he's not very comfortable with the idea of working people having a say in the government of the city-state of Rome. And when he returns triumphant from victory over the Volsci, he is urged to run for consul, a high office in the new republic. But to do so, he has to speak nicely to people who are not noble like him. He finds that very degrading. And you know what's even worse? He has to wear a gown of humility and expose his war wounds to them. And he can't stand this. He does a terrible job of being humble. And so the people, led by a pair of cynical populist tribunes, turn upon him. He is eventually exiled, and he decides to join his recently conquered enemies and mount a war against Rome. I won't tell you how it turns out. It is a very exciting story. But I think you can see the tragic ingredients here. They include pride, honor, anger, betrayal, and revenge. A man of honor, he aims to be what he calls author of himself. On the battlefield, he becomes a thing of blood, an engine of death. He's even described as a dragon. By the end, however, he is reduced to a boy of tears, and he is torn apart like a butterfly by wanton boys. This play is also about cultural elites who have trouble speaking to broad groups of people, about cynical populists who manipulate public opinion, and it's about leaders who refuse to take responsibility for the suffering of the people. Those are themes that remain very current today. And guess what? Shakespeare wrote this play while the theaters were closed because of the plague. And Coriolanus is teeming with references to contagion, plague, pestilence, sickness, and death. This play has been continually restaged to reflect different historical moments and crises. You may have seen Ray Fiennes, for example, set during the Serbian-Bosnian conflict. Many directors have set the play in Nazi Germany, with Coriolanus understood as an ambitious war hero, aiming to become a tyrant and a dictator. Bertolt Brecht adapted and rewrote the play as a communist manifesto. And the Royal Shakespeare Company set the play during the French Revolution, with Coriolanus as a young cadet appalled by the excesses of democracy. So is Coriolanus a dangerous autocrat who needs to be checked by the forces of a fledgling democracy in an emergent class war? 
Or is he a misunderstood military hero with a strong sense of personal integrity who is cruelly abandoned by the people whom he has protected? You be the judge. But the play is not only about war and politics. There is a strong domestic and psychological dimension as well. Coriolanus is married to the beautiful Virgilia, and he is the son of the powerful matriarch Volumnia. Her name speaks volumes. Shakespeare artfully contrasts two types of womanhood, the peace-loving wife, concern for the safety of her husband, and the ambitious war mom who lives through her son's victories. Each will be called upon to persuade Coriolanus to drop his war against Rome, but only one will prevail. Which one? That's something to look for. Another element in the play is Coriolanus' complex relationship with Alphidius, his rival and briefly his ally. He admires Alphidius' courage and strength, and there is even a homoerotic element in his attraction to his enemy. Look for the long mouth kiss between the two in this riveting production. You are in for a major treat. Spare staging inspired by ancient Roman graffiti and modern political organizing with lots of meaningful double casting emphasizes the basic conflicts in this play between war and peace, between men and women, between personal integrity versus the need to be flexible and accommodating, between a political order led by great men versus a system based on popular rule and the general will. It is a play dominated by bodily imagery, blood, sweat, tears. And one of the most powerful images in this production is of Coriolanus taking a shower. All the perfumes of Arabia won't wash this gripping image out of your mind. So enjoy the show. We look forward to seeing you back at the Barclay and at UCI when we can enjoy the arts together in the shared spaces of beauty and truth. Thank you.